the barn. Part three. I fought traffic back to the North Hollywood apartment and picked up some essentials as well as that damned box. I had stuffed it into the back of the tiny closet in the bedroom and covered it in clothes. I gazed at the faded rosewood, its chipped lacquer, and sighed as I carried it down to my car. A crow circled overhead and seemed to watch me as I placed it in the back seat and drove back to the bungalow house. No more running, I told myself. I sat down at our dining room table and opened the box. I began by looking at the next oldest stack of cards. I flipped the first one over and was only half surprised to see the symbol of a black bird, a crow, wings spread, with straight lines protruding from it and symbols I didn't recognize surrounding the image. Below it sat a large, upside-down cross. Dear Michael, the next cards read in my father's unmistakable script, If you are reading this and the box has found you, something has gone terribly wrong. I hope beyond all hope that you never, ever have to read this. First, you must know how incredibly sorry I am that you are tasked with this heavy burden, but we have no choice. Our grimoire has been burned, destroyed, and I only have these stupid cards available to me right now. My time is short, and I have a lot of writing to do. Heed what I write. Your life depends on it. I am a member of a secret order. Some call us witches, but we merely harness the will and mental energy found abundantly in the multiverse, as all religions do to some degree or other. We have a hierarchy of gods and rituals going back hundreds of years. I fear they may be lost forever. Before I continue, you have probably gathered that Christine and I were lovers, and I am sorry about this. Furthermore, Christine used our order's magic to kill your mother unwittingly. Such is the power of intention. There is so much I want to tell you, Michael, but I don't have the time. As I mentioned, our order's history goes back hundreds of years, and I had hoped one day to initiate you. Unfortunately, my plans were for naught. We have been at war for some time now, and I feared it would be too dangerous for you. It's a losing war, slow, hard, and bitter. One we almost certainly cannot win, I know that now. It's our own fault, my fault, mostly. We got too big for our britches, so to speak, when we discovered what lived on the land behind the bungalow house. I thought we could... He didn't finish his sentence. His handwriting became more furious and a little sloppy, unusual for him. He scratched out a few of the following sentences and continued with, We are paying a high price for my hubris. I am attempting a ritual that will end this evil and put them back where they came from, but it requires my ultimate sacrifice. If, for some reason, it does not work, and other members of our order haven't finished the job, I fear it is up to you to continue. Most of my order is dead or missing by now, and there will be little in the way of help for you. You are our last hope. But, Michael, remember this. I know you. I know your true strength. I know your true worth, and you are capable of becoming a much more powerful warlock than I ever was. I love you. Follow the instructions, wear the pendant, and know that I am always with you. I gaped at the cards. How could I have not known that my dad was some kind of weird cultist warlock? How had he hidden that from me? Did my mother know? 
Christine did what with who to kill my mother who died of cancer? How? My head was swimming with questions. I flipped the next card. Step one, it read. Protection. I started skimming the cards. There were all manner of instructions and arcane symbols I didn't recognize. The hand-drawn symbols looked like a combination of Celtic ruins, Sanskrit, and Latin. Step two, it read. Purification and initiation. My head swam. I started to see spots. Realizing I hadn't eaten or had water, I poured myself a glass and called Sarah. I wanted to hear her voice, to tell her what I had read, to laugh with her. I missed her so much already. She picked up. They had landed and were headed to curbside pickup. She sounded breathless. She's okay. Fiona is practically back to her old self. She's laughing and talking, and I'm just so happy. I almost cried with joy myself. Behind her, I could hear Fiona's voice as she asked Sarah for a snack. Sarah's voice darkened on the phone. I could hear her breathing heavily. I think those crazy women were right. I love you, but I will do whatever it takes to protect my daughter. I understand, I said. Just finish whatever this is soon so we can be together. I already feel better, lighter, being away. Away, she faltered. From me, I finished. Yes, well, 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 not, not, no, not just you. That house, all of it, she said. But don't doubt that I love you. Just make sure nothing happens to my bases, especially the Gibson, she laughed. There was a deep sadness in her voice, but I could also hear the relief. Okay, honey. I understand. I swallowed a huge quiver in my throat that threatened to come up out of my mouth. I want what's best for you and Fee. And demonic ghosts, or whatever, is certainly not it. What are you going to tell your parents? That my husband is under attack by dark forces, she quipped. I chuckled. Love you. Talk to you later. Love you. Later. I hung up. My eyes stung. Tears threatened to bubble out of them. I looked at those damn yellow note cards, the box, at our things scattered all over the house, at the barn through the back window. Even in the daylight I could see the light was on, glaring at me through that stupid sinister window. Something came over me then. I felt cloudy, for lack of a better term, like I was floating. It felt like a Valium dream. I casually watched my body from far above, but I also felt certainty, or take up arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. <laughs> I laughed to myself as I filled the sink with ice. I thrust my left arm into the ice and left it there. At first it was shocking and painful, but soon I lost all feeling in the arm. I took a deep breath and readied a kitchen knife. I felt as if I were gazing at a projection moving too slowly, each movement seeming to pass in slow motion. The barn window looked like it was smiling at me, a leering, evil smile. I remembered what Margie had said in the apartment. They're waiting for us after death, or some such thing. Well, if that were the case, at least I wouldn't be a burden to my family anymore. I began to press the kitchen knife into the top of my arm near the vein closer to my elbow, turned the knife to start cutting toward my wrist. I could hear voices now, distant and laughing. They seemed to come from everywhere at once, and they seemed quite pleased. I didn't care, and my vision clouded as I poked my numb skin. I thought for a moment that something was terribly wrong, but I was only observing my actions and not really a part of them. 
A commotion outside of the window over the kitchen sink snapped me out of my daze. Perched atop one of the outdoor trash cans was a giant-looking crow, bigger than any I'd ever seen. It flapped its wings and cawed loudly, strutting around on the lid of the trash can. All at once, I, I came back to myself and gazed down at my arm. A small crimson river was forming near my elbow. I let the knife crash to the floor and held my arm. The distant laughing voices and tunnel vision were gone, and the newfound silence seemed somehow startling. The crow had stopped moving and seemed to regard me from atop its perch. Suddenly I laughed. Thanks. I guess you saved my life, I said, my laugh building up in my belly and bursting out of my mouth. I was suddenly uncontrollably laughing. I couldn't stop. I sat down to catch my breath, my laughter echoing through the house. I'm talking to a bird, I said to no one in particular, and continued laughing until my stomach hurt and I was raw. When I finally calmed down, the bird was gone, and I carefully bandaged my arm where I had started to cut myself. Almost got me, I said aloud, still chuckling. There was no response. I began thinking of my next move. I went over the series of events in my mind again. The visitations, visions, the dream, the crazy ladies, the loss of my family, the damn box. I thought of calling a paranormal investigator or some such thing or even a psychic, but the thought of exposing someone else to whatever this was seemed wrong. I put my house back in order carefully placing all the items back that had been arranged on the floor. I fixed myself a stiff bourbon, and with a sigh, I opened the box. I removed the pendant and placed it around my neck. The cool weight of the silver chain was comforting, and I instantly felt slightly more grounded. Okay, Dad, I can't say I'm very happy with you. I don't deserve this shit for your mistakes, but... God damn it, I'll do it, I said in English and sign language to the air around me. The house was quiet. Okay, step one. Protection, I said out loud and began reading. Usually, you have to go through purification and initiation first, but since you are in danger, you must learn how to protect yourself. The card read, it then gave me a list of things to get. Chalk, herbs, certain stones. I was to go around the house and draw specific symbols in each room on the floor. I went out and got the sundry items I needed. Around my bed I drew a chalk circle and framed it in specific symbols. I placed stones in certain corners of the house. I was to burn cedar, sage, mugwort, and a few more herbs, which I did. I honestly felt rather silly doing these things, but I did them nonetheless. The last card of protection read, The most important aspect of protection, and magic in general, is your will. Your focus and mental energy. Where your will goes, you will go. You must turn on your imagination. Below is the invocation we use for protection. But, Michael, the invocation is not as important as your intent behind it. Our deities and prayers all act in this way. They are mere symbols of your intention, a frame to hang your mental energy on. Start by breathing, Michael. Sharpen your focus. If you have a meditation practice, do it for at least 15 minutes. Clear your mind. Next, open your imagination. Your imagination is the key to your intent. Feel your inner divine white light coming out of your chest and surrounding you. Feel it. It is the purest, clear, angelic light, and it radiates out of you. Imagine it coming from the heavens above and surrounding you, comforting you. The invocation in English is as follows. 
Lord High, Summoner of the Sea, Wind, Earth, Fire, we humbly thank you. Mistress of the directions north, south, east, and west, we humbly thank you. Lord High, Commander of Light and Darkness, we humbly thank you. Bless us with your light and protection, we humbled few who keep the flame alive, that one day the Father and Mother, summation of all, may grace us with their presence. Bless us with your light and protection. Amen. I puzzled over this section for a while, trying to wrap my brain around its meaning. It just seemed so silly. But I was willing to try anything at this point. I punched in a guided meditation on YouTube and completed it, I guess. I still felt pretty silly. I didn't know what my father meant by imagination and will and all that, but I hoped that the chalk symbols and smelly herbs were enough. I then read the protection incantation out loud. I waited for something to happen, but the house was silent. Daylight was fading, and I got myself ready to go to bed early. I was extremely exhausted from the little amount of sleep I had gotten over the preceding days. What followed was the longest night of my life. The moment my head hit the pillow, I was asleep. I seemed to blink, and suddenly it was completely dark, which was odd because I had left every single light on in the house except the bedroom. The power must be out, I thought. I turned to look at my phone. 3.10 a.m. Shit. I instinctively reached out to touch Sarah on my right but the bed was cold and empty. I stared at the ceiling for a little while, when suddenly the light flipped on in the barn window. Here we go, I muttered to myself. I wasn't sure what to do. Do I go in there? Stay here? I decided against going to the barn, so I waited. The minutes ticked by with interminable slowness. Just as I began to nod off again, I heard a small creak in the kitchen. Not a footstep, just a slight groaning of the house. My heart sped up. The creak repeated itself a little louder and longer. Then it sounded again, only this time it began to resemble the sound of the deck of an old wooden ship. I held my breath. Before night fell, I thought I was ready for this, but now that it was happening, I wasn't so sure. The fear was too palpable, my heart beating too fast. When the creaking stopped, the house lay still. The silence was deafening for a few minutes. I continued waiting, hands trembling. That's when the voices started. All at once it seemed that I could hear them. They came from every direction at once. I could discern that they were at a party. They were laughing and talking, and I thought I could hear the clink of plateware, wine pouring and merrymaking. Then I heard a chime, like a small dinner bell, struck three times. The party stopped. All was silent again, but I could feel something in the air. Was that expectation? The world seemed to be dangling on a knife point. Then I heard a small bang in the living room, like something was being thrown on the ground. I threw the blanket over my face, all thoughts of bravery gone, biting my sheets. I then heard something being dragged across my living room floor. It sounded like a heavy cloth sack wrapped in chains. 
It stopped with a thud on the threshold between the dining area and the kitchen. I squeezed myself into a tight ball and shut my eyes. I placed my hands over my ears, but the noises seemed to continue unbidden. I heard a muffled cry, maybe a female, I couldn't be sure. Then, clear as day, I heard the sounds of chains being pulled as if they were running over a wooden beam on a crank. Silence again, heart pounding, eyes tight. I smelled it before I heard it, a distant scent of wood smoke and flames. It seemed to tickle the back of my nose. I wondered if my house were on fire, but I dare not open my eyes or come out from under my blanket. Let the fire get me, I thought. Then I heard that damned singing from my dream again. It started as a low hum and worked its way into an atonal nightmare of sound. No matter how hard I pressed my ears, the singing continued. It was at this point that I heard the scream. It was a female's voice, and I recognized the sound from experience. It was the sound of someone being consumed with flame. Her moans of agony must have lasted two minutes, but to me it felt endless. When it was over, I could still hear the crackling and roaring fire and smell charred flesh. I remembered the pain of being burned alive and shuddered, clutching my arms. Then the soundscape suddenly ceased. All was quiet for a time, and I began to pull the covers from off my face. My head was pounding. I was drenched in sweat. My heart had not stopped its incessant pounding, and I wondered why I hadn't plunged that knife into my veins to let myself die earlier. I would have rather been dead than go through another moment of this. I waited for some time, maybe an hour, I don't know, but I knew it wasn't finished. That now familiar tickle started to work its way up my leg and through my spine and into the top of my head, thousands of tiny pinpricks, a chill. The air became heavy. I braced myself for whatever was next. It started as a slight hissing sound, like a fog machine in a theater production. The door to the bedroom slowly creaked open, despite the fact that I had locked it. I willed myself to keep my eyes on the door, and in the darkness I saw a black shape, larger than an average person, float into the doorway. It looked like smoke, but as it drifted closer to my bed, it began to form into something solid, the fog-like tendrils coalescing into a large black mass. This is what killed my father, I thought to myself, for my heart was beating so furiously that I thought I myself might indeed have a heart attack. I opened my mouth to say something. What? I don't know. Maybe those words my father had written on that yellow card, but my mouth seemed to be made of sawdust and I couldn't speak a word. The shape hovered forward and I began to make out more details. It was a person, hung upside down, feet wrapped in chains or rope, covered in a sack. The person twitched and their arms dangled close to the ground. I reached for my cell phone, wondering if light would chase it away. My shaking hands managed to turn on the flashlight, and I turned the beam toward the huge shape. This remains the worst mistake of my life to this day. This was no dream. This was happening in my waking life. Rather than chase it away, it illuminated the figure with full clarity for just a moment before my phone failed, drained of power. But that was enough. Half the face was charred, with bits of flesh flaking off, and a 
black skeletal jawbone protruded through the skin along with a deep burnt eye socket. The other half of the face was singed almost beyond recognition and I saw one pale gray eye roving wildly in its socket. I noticed it was a female, and though most of her hair had been singed off, I saw shocks of white and red dangling from the skull. It was Margie, the barn's former illegal tenant, the lady who had entered the North Hollywood apartment and shot herself. She twitched and rotated, struggling to reach her bound feet under the black sack that covered most of her body. Then she let herself go and hung freely for a moment, as if the effort were too strenuous for her, fixing her gaze on me. I could smell burnt ash and something like sweet, rotten dirt. I noticed a strange sound, like a distant yell on a stormy night. It wasn't too long before I noticed that it was a scream emanating from my own mouth. Despite my utter terror, I noticed that she had not come upon me, and I glanced down at the floor. She remained just at the edge of the chalk circle I had drawn earlier. Heart pounding, blood boiling, I tried to remember what my father had wrote. The box now lived under my bed, but there was no time to open it and read that damn card again. The will and the light, or, or something like that, I desperately tried to remember. I looked down, and in the darkness I could make out the upside-down figure begin to move along the perimeter of the circle, probing for weaknesses, I guessed. I still don't know to this day how through my terror I found that certain clarity. The figure, or what had been Margie, began to make sounds, terrible moaning noises that sounded like a strange form of language similar to the singing I had heard earlier. The voice sounded like ripping sandpaper. At that moment, I finally figured out that Margie was not attacking me herself. She was a tortured vessel of sorts. I was only seeing a fraction of what this thing was. Suddenly, I felt an immense pressure. Not a physical pressure, per se, but a kind of unseen force pushing at the perimeter of my body. It was very strong and vibrated with an alarming intensity. I knew instantly that if I allowed it to reach me, something very bad would happen. My skin crawled and I was suddenly very nauseous. It was like an unseen tentacle wrapping around the edge of my body, slowly tightening its grip. Sheer terror overwhelmed me. I imagine I felt like a mouse does as it waits to be crushed to death by a python. It was at this moment when the terror had stripped away the remaining parts of me that I would consider myself, that I remembered the instructions written on that card. I imagined a clear white light emanating from my chest, falling from the sky and surrounding me. The groaning noises originating from the being got louder, and the force pressing on me gave way just a little bit. Whatever I was doing seemed to be working. The figure backed up slightly. It took all of my might to imagine the clear light and press it against the immense force pushing on me. I envisioned the light growing bigger and engulfing more of the room. The thing backed up further. Taking the initiative, I pushed harder. I could feel the light, my willpower, pushing it back. It was really working. But soon the figure screamed with an ear-splitting force, and it began its own counterattack, shrinking my light bubble. It let out another cry of rage and assaulted me with an incredible force that vibrated through my entire body. I felt immense pressure, like I was thrust many feet underwater. It made my head spin and I began to lose focus. My bubble shrank, 
I could feel my psyche crumbling against its might. I'm too weak to stand up to this thing, I thought in despair. You were wrong, Dad, I thought sadly. I can't do it. At the thought of my father, a new surge of energy seemed to well up inside me, and a strength I never knew I possessed caused me to cry out. Through my utter terror, I felt a new emotion welling up from the pit of my stomach. Rage. I opened my mouth and let out a cry. With every last drop of strength I possessed, I emitted the imaginary light energy and I finally felt something shift. I opened my eyes and watched as the upside down figure retreated to the doorway, losing its physical form as it floated. It then appeared to melt away into a kind of smoke that dissipated into the air. The house was silent. I heard a distant dog barking. Somewhere a crow shrieked. The lights I had left on in the house flipped back on, and I saw the barn light go out. A triumphant feeling overcame me. I had won. For how long? I wasn't sure, but I was too tired to think or move. I fell back on the bed and slept for ten hours. When I awoke, afternoon light made its way through the blinds. Noticing that my phone was still out of batteries, I plugged it into the wall and stiffly got out of bed. My head felt like it had been punched numerous times. The house was in complete tatters. Furniture lay strewn every which way. Pieces of broken plates and glass were thrown all over the kitchen. The symbols I had drawn with chalk were all smudged out and the stones I had bought were in fragments all over the house as if they had exploded. After chugging three glasses of water, I instinctively went to the backyard and opened the barn door. I mildly looked at Sarah's musical equipment still sitting in order. Well, at least they didn't touch those, I thought. I trudged up the stairs to the second floor and surveyed the area. A large pile of ash lay on the floor in a perfect circle about six feet in diameter. Scorch marks radiated from it, and some of the items in the room were singed. I nodded my head blandly and made my way back inside. There was a crow standing on top of one of the branches of the orange tree. Oh, hi, I said out loud. I could really go for some Thai food right now. How about you? The crow regarded me serenely and took off in a westerly direction, cawing as it went. I sighed and returned to the house to power on my phone. There were two messages from my wife. Without listening to them, I called her. She picked up on the first ring. Hey, how are you? We've been worried about you. I haven't heard from you. I'm good, I said. She paused. How are things over there? Did did anything happen? Is it over? She asked. I considered this for a moment. No. Nothing happened. I just slept in today is all. Forgot to plug in my phone. Your instruments are just fine also, I added hopefully. Oh good. That's great to hear. We're just in the middle of a late lunch. Can I call you later? Yeah, sure, sounds good. Love you, I said. Love you too, she said and hung up. I looked sorrowfully at the phone. I missed my little Fiona, my wife. I ordered some Thai delivery and sat down in front of my dad's rosewood box. I opened the lid and flipped the cards to the next section. Purification and Initiation Perhaps I had beaten them, and I didn't have to do any more of this stuff, I thought. I'll be on a plane to Sacramento in three hours. Michael, it read, If you are reading this after completing the first section, congratulations. I knew you could do it. 
you now know how to basically protect yourself. My heart began to sink, but know that the onslaught will not cease. This is but the beginning of your journey. You must follow these instructions and prepare yourself for, perhaps, a lifetime battle. This war will test you in ways you never thought possible, and you must win. I don't know what will happen if you lose, but something will be loosed on humanity far worse than any disease or weapon known to man. Be diligent. You are stronger than you know. Tears began to sting my face, and I placed my head in my hands. No, I thought. No, no, God, no. Dad, what have you done? This was about six months ago. Now most of my time is spent mastering my father's group's techniques and holding off the inverted. I've also been doing research into other ways to fight them. Alchemy, New Age rituals, Christian, Jewish, and Muslim exorcisms, Buddhist meditations, whatever I can get my hands on, really. I dare not ask anyone to help. A priest or some kind of spiritual ghostbuster for fear that they will be exposed to this poisonous entity. I've been looking into the past for clues. My feeling is that they've been around for a long, long time, predating even the Tongva and Chumash who originally inhabited this land. I also think the inverted are part of a single dark unity, a hive mind of sorts. They can't always attack me the way they did that first night, but they have many ways of wearing a person down. Many insidious ways. My overeager father and his coven, the Order of the Twilight Vision, awoke them from their slumber in order to gain their knowledge or power or something, as far as I can tell. Idiots. Now my very existence is dedicated to putting them it back to sleep. I shudder to think of what it may do unleashed into our world, already besotted with dark entities, climate catastrophe, and war. As my father mentioned, Twilight Vision's book of spells and history was destroyed by the inverted, or one of their agents. Hundreds of years of history and craft burned to ash. But I have started a new book painstakingly copying the knowledge my father left on his yellow cards into a single grimoire, even adding my own knowledge and strategies that work against the inverted. I quit my job. I don't see my daughter or my wife for fear of putting them in harm's way, and now I hardly talk to them on the phone or digitally. Too dangerous, I think. Most of my nights are spent in fear, though I have made my peace with that emotion. Sometimes I don't see signs of the inverted for days, and I wonder if I have won. But that is only a part of their insidious tricks. I now know how to hurt them and beat them back. But I fear I can only keep them at bay for so long. They are relentless, tireless. The crows visit me often. I suppose it's comforting. I sometimes wonder if I will be one of those crows someday, watching over someone else tasked with destroying the inverted. For now, I must stay strong and live in this hellish reality until it is finally over. <laughs>